doing anything with that um i'm alive i'm alive my friends the show did not manage to kill me off but uh it gave quite a good try is that the best you can do you're gonna have to kill me sorry for the month without any updates uh but it was the holidays and i didn't want to make such a dreadful video where we were supposed to be celebrating with love and cheer so and i kid you not i have seen some shit anyway uh, now that I'm on a consistent schedule and I'm having more free time, I'm hoping to start uploading a bit more frequently. Uh, I'm gonna shoot for a video a week, but we will see what life throws at us, shall we? We'll see. We will see. Uh, let's get into this review, shall we? I don't want to. That's it. This episode was the final nail in the coffin for Tolkienian adaptations. Never again will Middle-earth cinema ever reach the heights it once climbed 20 years ago. The casket is sealed and will never be reopened. We are doomed to gestate in a world of absolute mediocrity, and it is all thanks to the season one of The Rings of Power. Know that the amount of self-control I needed to not bludgeon my TV, or my eyeballs for that matter, with an axe while ingesting this whimsical pilfering toilet watered down crapshoot TV show would give Goku a run for his money. This episode took such a massive dump on Tolkien's work, even Ian Malcolm was impressed with it. That is one big pile of shit. There's simply no way to sift through every single grain of contrived nonsense in a timely manner. This is taking too long! Oh, the pyramids that I could build from the metaphorical concrete slabs of perverted gibberish that the Rings of Power churns out in every single scene. I could easily create the eighth wonder of the world and title it The Rings of Power, the Great Pyramid of Amateurs and Mediocrity. Or simply, literal eye poison. My eye! At this point, it's not even worth mentioning anything positive about this episode. The bitter end to a bitter series where the negatives outweigh the positives by literal metric tons. Since I put off doing a review for this episode, I was told by several colleagues to give it a chance, that it was the best episode yet, and that the payoff was huge. Uh, but because I have the brain power greater than that of a demented aardvark, and because the show has scored zero out of seven for intelligent and meaningful writing, I went into it expecting it to be horrible, and boy, was I right. Did any of you doubt me at this point? 
As always, nothing you writers could have done in episode 8 could make up for all of the pillaging you've done in the past 7 hours. So, why should I expect anything better? You were born a street rat. You'll die a street rat. You've demonstrated your complete incompetence incessantly with every jot and tittle of every single episode. So don't get mad at us when we become completely complacent in our views on literal eye poison. My eye! Let's kill it. I mean, get into it, shall we? I'm just gonna put this in a safer place while I record. You know, don't want any... Don't want any misfires going off while I do this, you know, so we're gonna put it in a safe spot, shall we? You can tell that in this episode, the main thing the writers were going for was epic reveals. There are three big reveals in this episode that were anything but epic. Sucks to be you, nerd. They were probably meant to have a massive impact, but ultimately, anyone with half a brain saw these reveals coming from miles away, reducing them to just trivial gasping moments that lasted about a second. Oh no! Anyway, last week... They were in no particular order. Ew, the oldie moldy wizard dude that piggybacked off of a meteor to get his stupid face to Middle-earth? He is Gandalf! No shit, Sherlock! Hella Brimbor's gonna make something that'll save Middle Earth. That is small, round, circular, and an alloy of mithril. It's the Elven Rings. Oh, really? Next time, why don't we take another 45 minutes to beat around the bush, why don't we? I don't think you were foreshadowing nearly enough. And the last, and certainly the least, the mysterious fallen king that seems to have excellent forms of manipulation and exploitation of those around him, demonstrating his ability to get people to do what he wants, as well as seemingly superhuman strength and a background in blacksmithing? Who could this guy be? Uh, I don't know. Uh... That is a penumbra! I have... I have no idea! Sauron?! What an absolute gyration of events this is! No. Not really. It's not like the writers are so incompetent that what should have been subtle hints and foreshadowing was about as precise as a Civil War cannon blasting through a donut shop! You seriously thought that these reveals were surprising? The only way you could have convinced us of ignorance of each of these would be A. If no person watching the show knew literally anything about the lore, backstories, or origins of anything that Tolkien wrote. Is everyone in your family an idiot? Or B. Maybe not be the most predictable and simple-minded storytellers of all time? Sorry boys, looks like you SUCK on all possible fronts. You suck. My next question is going to be, where do y'all go from here? What other epic reveals do you have up your sleeves that will tie audiences over for the next season? My guess would be <laughs> none. Nothing! You've got nothing! Nothing! You are banking on the intrigue and mystery to keep your viewers watching. In fact, it could probably be argued that the unanswered questions and badly vague writing is the only thing that kept casual viewers around. People will still watch a show or a movie even if the first half of it is terrible, just to see how it ends. Intrigue can hold people's attention long after they've accepted that the acting is terrible, the action is cringe, and the story is nonsensical and it's completely unfaithful to its original work. Oh wait, you lost 20% of your viewers after just the first episode? That sucks. Looks like people still didn't care about your fake controversies and mysteries. Your viewers are going to have literally nothing tethering them to the next season. So again, I ask, where are you going to go from here? Are you hoping to cash in on the adventures of fake Gandalf and discount Frodo? What are they going to be even doing? Eating slugs and picking berries? Oh yeah, that sounds really great to watch. Gross. Speaking of not Gandalf, what is up with the latest trend of main characters saying the most cringy lies? before doing like a blast of a magical stupid energy or like a stupid karate move. And I am Iron Man. And I am all the Jedi. I'm good. Mm. Cheesy.
It's so cheesy. The only one that did it even the smallest bit of justice was Tony Stark in Endgame, and even then it was pushing the envelope of really tacky. Can we also talk about how blazingly incompetent these discount wish-bought ring wraiths are? They were built to be the most intimidating servants of Sauron for like the entire latter end of the show, and yet they are easily felled by a couple of hobbits with pebbles. Are you trying to not take yourself seriously at all? Also, why in the hell did Rebate Eminem decide to disguise herself to lure out the hobbits? She literally had no reason to do this. The hobbits are no threat to her, and they don't do anything for fake Gandalf, so why would she possibly be trying to lure them? <sighs> This implies that she was just trying to get the hobbits to come to her so that she could kill them, but she's already blown up all of their carts and, like, left them stranded in desolation. It was literally for no reason than to give us this jump scare. And a really, really lame one at that. Here the writers go again, thinking that action and content makes up for garbage writing. Probably not. The only good thing that came out of this whole debacle was the death of one of the most psychotic, murderous Harford douchebags. Good riddance, you manslaughtering loon. I feel nothing but joy when your life essence rips from its vessel, you clawed pole. You deserve every bit of it for teaching a sociopathic orthodox that is disguising itself as loving and endearing. Not to mention that if this dude is Gandalf, it just creates an entire myriad of problems. I love that word, myriad, myriad, it's pretty cool. The Astari, aka Wizards of Middle-earth, didn't come to Middle-earth from Valinor until the Third Age, you scurvy pipsqueaks. Yes, people have argued that it is somewhat unclear when the Astari came to Middle-earth because Tolkien has two separate accounts of the event, but the most detailed of the these two accounts chronicles Gandalf and the other Astari arriving in the Grey Havens in the Third Age. Oh yeah, and it was by boat, not Armageddon Michael Bay rock flying, okay? <laughs> what the hell is even that so stupid when gandalf arrived at the gray havens kirden the elven shipwright gave him the ring of fire narya one of the three elven rings of power because he saw in him a struggle against future evils which is why he knew he needed the strength of Arya. oh but that's not exciting enough is it we need the audience to be gaping and gawking the entire time so uh quick let's throw in gandalf in a writing meteor and have him say a line that gandalf said people will like that right what? You can't be serious. Why is Gandalf here? Why? Just why? Why, 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 why? Why, 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 why? He had literally nothing to do with anything in the Second Age, and basically had literally nothing to do with anything in this TV show, too. You're useless. Literally nothing in the Second Age. None of the wizards did. The only person in Middle-earth that was more powerful than Gandalf was Sauron, okay? And I know that really flies in the face of all you girl bosses out there being like, what, what about Galadriel? She's so much more powerful. Gandalf is like, so freaking old. Like, older than Middle-earth, okay? He was there in Valinor before the elves were even created, okay? He is way more powerful than any other elf that has ever existed. Just go read the books, okay? Just read a book once in your life. Gandalf was more powerful powerful than Galadriel, he was more powerful than Elrond, he was more powerful than Gilgalad, he was obviously more powerful than a Balrog, all because he was a Maiar, basically a demigod of Middle-earth. So if he's gonna be in Middle-earth when the Second Age is happening, then he better be in the Battle of the Last Alliance, otherwise his character of wanting to help the people of Middle-earth and fight against Sauron is completely ruined. Not to mention the fact that he was sent to Middle-earth to fight against the all-powerful Sauron, he even confided in the Valar that that he was afraid of Sauron and wanted to stay in Valinor. So why are you anvil brains jumping the gun and sending him to Middle Earth before he even has a purpose there? Idiot. Oh, I know why. Because you thought, wouldn't it be cool if Gandalf was in our TV show? And for no other reason. That is what your entire writing model is based off of. The very J.J. Abrams approach of, wouldn't it be cool if? No, you plague boils. It's not cool. It's the stupidest thing ever. That's stupid. You're stupid. Stop being stupid. 
Man, I hate you guys. Next, we find out that the absolute greatest master smith since the all-powerful Feanor, Celebrimbor, literally knows nothing about alloys. Great, yet another Tolkien male role model is neutered for the sake of a fan fiction. Oh, the 2,000 plus year old Elvin Smith, the man that devoted the entirety of his life to perfecting metallurgy and blacksmithing, an elf that not only survived the fall of Gondolin, but also established and became the ruler of a region? That Celebrimbor? Yeah, he's basically never heard of an alloy before. And thank heavens that this random bum kiss got his belly slashed open so that he could stumble into a region and have the exact information needed for Celebrimbor to complete his work. Oh, <laughs> wonderful! Really? I'm so glad that these coincidences have coincidenced to give us the most perfect coincidence to ever coincidence! Now, there will be those that argue that Sauron did help Celebrimbor to forge the rings that would later be given to each race, so it makes sense he's helping him here. But guess what, jackweeds? Sauron taught Celebrimbor how to create rings of power specifically. Rings that had the ability to prolong the life of mortals or to increase the power that was already in an individual. He didn't show him the absolute basics of alloy making and jewelry smithing. Uh, duh. And not only that, but Sauron only had a direct impact on the making of the 16 other rings given to the dwarves and men, he didn't even know that the other three elven rings existed. All of this lore gets thrown to the wayside when we have this soy boy Sauron teaching Celebrimbor how to be even just an entry-level jewel smith, but also literally counsel him throughout the entire process and even handle the tools used to craft the rings. Stupid. Hey, but Elijah, he left before they made the rings. Shut up! Shut up, Grandma! He was there when they literally described the object being a ring. He was the one that came up with the idea to forge them more gently, whatever that means. He was with Celebrimbor non-stop for like a whole friggin' week to forge them. He helped in literally every step of the way to make them. Okay, he knows about the rings at this point. Okay? Okay! This seemingly small plot hole blows an entire hole in the wall of lore. Sauron didn't know about the Elven Rings because Celebrimbor didn't trust him. That's why Celebrimbor made the Three Rings to counteract any power or influence that he thought the mysterious Anatar had put on the rings that he had made. He deliberately made them away from Sauron so that he would have no influence on them. As far as Sauron was concerned, these three Elven Rings didn't exist, but Tweedle Dumbo and Tweedle Retard have basically ensured that Sauron will know about them when Season 2 comes around. Good job. Even if by some miracle Sauron didn't pick up on the three rings being made, which is truly impossible at this point, he is still going to come back to Eregion disguised as Anatar. so if he doesn't know about them now, he sure will then. The only way Anatar slash Sauron could be ignorant of the three elven rings down the road will be if he, one, avoids Gilgalad, Galadriel, and Elrond, and also literally of thousands of elves that helped in the smithing process process, and also avoided literally everyone that was merely present in Eregrion, or who has even just seen three of the most famous elves in public. Well, good luck with that. They are out in the open now! He's gonna see the Elven Rings! And now that Sauron knows that they exist, there's no chance in hell that he would make a ring that has no sway over the most powerful elves in Middle-earth. He'd have to scrap his entire plan of making the one ring. It's because Sauron doesn't know that the elves have three of their own rings of power that he makes the one ring, thinking he will have total dominion over them. You have literally taken away your main protagonist's motivation to do the thing we all know he's going to do. So congratulations, bros. You have now painted yourself into a plot hole written corner that will only make the inconsistencies with the lore and the overall story that much more glaring and obvious. Just for the record, this is a very bad idea. Want to know how to spot a completely untalented writer? They make plot holes not only in their current story, but for future ones. You absolute bull-pizzled stockfish. Does it get stupider? Yep. 
You have no idea. You thought Galadriel was stupid for never comparing the mark of Sauron to a map for thousands of years? That is nothing compared to how brainless they make her out to be in this episode. Remember when Galadriel just assumed that this complete stranger was king of the Southlands for the sole reason that he was carrying a random butt medallion? Yeah, only after she finds out that he is a smithy does she realize, hmm, I've done zero background checks on this guy to see if he's legit. Maybe I ought to look into his backstory and make sure he didn't just find a random medallion so he could gain political power over a group of people. So what do you know? There is nothing linking good old Halbrand to the kings of the Southlands. So Galadriel confronts him about it and it takes about 2.5 seconds for Halbrand to be like, <laughs> whoops. Yeah, you got me. I'm Sauron and stuff. <laughs> wow, so you're not even going to try to convince her of something else? You've pulled the wool over her eyes for this long. Isn't it in your best interest to keep her in the dark about your true identity, considering she's been hunting you for the past millennia? Nah, might as well come clean. She's a bit doubtful of the lie that I've been telling her this whole time. Let's just rip the band-aid off. Are you retarded? Wow, talk about retarded. Sauron is supposed to be the master of disguise and beguile, and here he just gives up his biggest secret advantage after the smallest amount of pushback? I didn't think it was possible, but the writers made even the main protagonist completely incompetent. He literally made no effort to keep the advantage over her. He just decided to come clean immediately. In no world are these two Saurons even close to being the same. Remember the first time you saw Sauron in Fellowship of the Ring? Remember when he was so scary and intimidating it made you want to crawl under your bed and die? Oh, was that just me? Yeah, that was Sauron. That was power. That Sauron made your skin crawl. This guy? Nah. Nah. He is not Sauron. Who do you think? He looks like he needs to be on the cover of a Cologne commercial, not the Lord of Mordor. He looks like an edgy waiter that's been working at Texas Roadhouse for the past decade. Hashtag not my Sauron. How are we supposed to be afraid of this guy? He sucks on virtually every level. You suck, you jackass. Can't intimidate, can't coerce, can't lie, gets intimidated by a five foot nothing blonde bimbo. He sucks! Congrats, writers! Your main villain is a beta cuck soy boy that screams when elf girl won't sleep with him. It's great, you're a soy boy beta cuck. Uh, what? Whatever. And with that transition, we get probably one of the most appalling breaks to the lore, if that's even possible. Once Not Sauron blows his cover, he then does an illusion to try gaining Galadriel's trust by disguising himself as her bro Finrod, which she sees through immediately because she's literally already established that he's Sauron, so how would she not see through this instantly? Again, Sauron sucks at the one thing he was profoundly good at in the books. Anyways, friggin' Discount Sauron sits there and tries to convince Bimbo Ladrill that the only way to save Middle-earth is to rule it. If that's not the dumbest pitch I've ever heard... You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. The only thing Middle-earth needs saving from is you, you retard. You're the only reason the so-called elves are dying from supposed darkness. So if you weren't there, then what would Middle-earth need saving from? Also, what is your goal in helping Celebrimbor make the rings? By your own storytelling, the rings are made for the sole purpose of dispelling the evil from the world. The evil that you are causing! So what, you're trying to thwart your own plans? Why? You are stupid. Look at that, I just followed the writer's logic to its full conclusion, and guess what? It's retarded. Well, that's retarded. The writers have defended that their reason for making Galadriel tempted by Sauron by pointing out this line from the Fellowship of the Ring. Referring to Sauron, Galadriel says, I know his mind, and he gropes ever to know mine, but still, the door is shut. The writers took that single line and thought, oh man, Galadriel and Sauron totally wanted to bang. What? Are you kidding me? That was the conclusion that you came to with a single line in the books? Ooh, Sora must have tried seducing Gladriel in the past, and that's why she has a freakout 3,000 years later. There are about 20 other nuanced ways to interpret a single line with zero context. Y'all picked literally the dumbest one possible. Congratulations, you're stupid in three languages. I get the feeling that this is the tried and true method that the showrunners were basically referring to whenever they claimed 
to continuously go back to the book, go back to the book, go back to the book. Go back to the book, go back to the book, go back to the book. We called it a bullshit. <laughs> Basically summed up, pick one single random line in any of the books that we have the rights to and pretzel twist it into whatever discombobulated, maimed, pitiful excuse for a narrative that pushes whatever agenda we want. Look at that, we can do whatever we want and claim that it's Tolkienian. You're a goddamn genius! Oh, we're just filling in the cracks of the story that Tolkien never told. If that is synonymous with BSing our way into making the most expensive fanfic of all time. <laughs> Never, at any point in history, was Galadriel tempted by Sauron. Never, never, ever, ever, for never, ever? Never, ever, never, never, ever, ever, never! The line the showrunners were referring to was in the context of the fact that Galadriel is able to perceive the Dark Lord's mind because she has a ring of power. But he is not able to discern hers because her ring wasn't made by him. Yes, Galadriel was tempted by the power of the One Ring, but that's because Sauron designed it that way, to give whoever came in contact with it delusions of power and majesty so that he could eventually dominate their will. The One Ring magnifies the power of whoever wears it, so obviously Galadriel would have been tempted to take it. But newsflash, that's not the same thing as being smooth-talked into husbanding Sauron and ruling as his queen. Hey, der. You know who else distrusted Anatar when he came to Eregion to forge the rings with Celebrimbor? Galadriel. She couldn't see through his disguise, but she knew he had ulterior motives, and as a result, never trusted him. That's a big flip and leap to go from not trusting you with a 10-foot pole to being tempted to do the sexy times with a total stranger. That's dumb. You're dumb. Even if we just completely discount the lore, which is clearly what the showrunners are doing here, Galadriel has no reason to trust Halbrand, and hasn't ever. Never, ever, 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 ever. The only thing that they've built their entire relationship on is the slight chance that Halbutt might maybe be the king of the Southlands, so their motivations have the absolute puniest of overlaps. Even the cruddy, stupid version of Galadriel that they wrote is acting out of character. How is this even possible? The outright lack of writing experience is really showing through at this point, guys. It doesn't look good on you, but it does belong on you. Yeah, jackass. And the scene ends with Butthead, Ladrail, and Dumbo Sauron having a screaming fest at each other because that's how eternal, immortal, all-powerful beings handle themselves like adults, right? Shrieking at each other like toddlers until one of them breaks out and slaps, or in this case, stabbies. I will say I was happy to see Faux Ladriel almost drown to death again. Anytime I see one of these disgraces to Tolkien's work start to slowly die, it gives my stomach the butterflies. Then Butthead Ladriel wakes up to Sauron gone. What should she do? Well, I mean, this is the person that killed her brother, the one responsible for desecrating everything that she loved, the man she has been hunting for nigh on a millennia. Surely Galadriel gets on her horse and catapults her way into whatever direction he went. After all, even if he left hours before she woke up, she should be able to catch up to him easily considering he's on foot, and she should definitely take all of her men with her and easily overpower him, destroying evil once and for all, right? 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 She's just like, eh, I guess he's gone now, nothing I can do about it. <laughs> what? 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 The only thing that Galadriel has been motivated to do for the past eight hours is kill Sauron. They've been drilling this into our head that she doesn't care about anyone else except for that guy. I didn't care about anyone else but that guy. For eight hours. And the moment she has a chance to kill him, she just lets him go. She just lets him go. What was the freaking Point! What's the f purpose? You're a murderer! A mass murderer of people's time! I get not killing Sauron off in the first season, because you'll obviously need him in your later seasons, if anyone's still watching at this point. Uh, probably not. But she doesn't even try to pursue him? What an absolute, ungodly waste of my time. <gasps>
I've wasted my life! Eh, hey, but Elijah, if she told everyone who Sauron was, then they wouldn't trust her anymore. Cause she trusted him, and he was a bad guy. Come here. Shut your stupid ass up! Literally everyone, and I mean everyone, has trusted Halbrand for the entire show. Nobody would get mad at her for trusting the person that was able to convince everyone to put their confidence in him. In fact, everyone would be undoubtedly furious that she knew who Sauron was and didn't chase him when she had every opportunity to. You moron. They'd be like, what the shit, Galadriel? You knew that this bitch was Sauron the whole time? Maybe, just maybe. Maybe you could have told us Halbrand was literally the most evil guy in Middle-earth, so we could have caught and killed him before he, oh, I don't know, corrupted the Numenorean people into trusting him, causing them to perform human sacrifices to Morgoth, convinced our Farazhan to literally invade Valinor, single-handedly caused the flooding of Numenor, built the fortress of Barad-dûr, forged an entire continent into his domain, gained the trust of the entire elven race, forged 16 rings of power turning 9 kings of men into Nazgul slaves, destroyed Eregion and murdered Celebrimbor, hoisting his mutilated dead body onto a banner and displaying it all across Middle Earth? Do you think it would have been a good idea to tell us that, moron Ladriel, so that we could have literally saved millions of lives? No? All right, somebody shoot her. Please, please, please. Somebody, somebody shoot her. Shoot her! Shoot her! Now Galadriel is responsible for every single person that Sauron kills and every single travesty he incurs. She's the new Obi-Wan Kenobi! Deciding to spare the main antagonist of the show that will go on to kill millions when they have every right and the means to kill them and absolutely no reason not to? Wonderful. Just... wonderful. That is not great. Don't worry, I could riff about this episode for another hour if I wanted to, and normally I would end the video right here. But you've already been watching for the past 20 minutes, so let's keep going, shall we? Plus, we are nowhere even near the amount of contrivances and absolute bounds in logic that this show takes. Hold on to your butts. I've just pointed out the three biggest ones. There are quite a few more, and all they do is leave massive open-ended questions in every single scene. Questions like, seriously, who in the hell are those stupid priest ladies? Like seriously, who the hell are they? And why did they even exist in this story? They literally accomplished nothing for the entirety of their screen time. You could completely take them out of the narrative and nothing would have changed except for the death of a genocidal hobbit, which is only good for everybody. Speaking of which, why did none of the hobbits do anything to save Sadduk's life? I mean, I want him dead just as much as any rational person, but these hobbits do nothing to to save his life. People survive stab wounds all the time. When someone gets stabbed, people don't just sit around and accept their fate and let them die while looking at the sunrise like a total bitch. If that was the case, then Frodo wouldn't have even made it past Weathertop for Pete's sake. Put some pressure on the wound, I don't know, or at least find some herbs to take the edge off, I don't know, just do something. You shall not have died in vain. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite dead, sir. Well, you shall not have been mortally wounded in vain. Farewell, sweet Concord! I'll just stay here then, shall I, sir? Worthless. How did the sunset come up at the exact time for Sadduk to look at it while he died? And no, it's not heartfelt. I felt nothing. I haven't in years. I am dead inside. Why do the priestesses think that faux Gandalf is Sauron? Sauron wasn't taken to Valinor in chains like his master Melkor, so the meteor couldn't have possibly been him. He's been in Middle-earth the whole time. So why did the priestess ladies think that this dude was Sauron? They should have just been looking for him the whole time anyway. It's just dumb. Think about that. That's just dumb. Why does this scream? <laughs> and this line? You fell below the dust, yet dust fears you. What the hell are you on about? Make me want to light myself on fire and swallow a feces-ridden porcupine. Why is Nori quoting Batman to a fake wizard? Only you can show what you are. You choose by what you do. It's not who I am underneath. The 
what I do that defines me. Did this actually happen, or did I take one of my roommate's supposed brownies again? Next, how in the blazes did Halbrand survive six days horse ride with a friggin' foot-long gash in his stomach? If everything else didn't tell Galadriel he's Sauron, then this definitely should have. Hey Halbrand, uh, no offense, but we've been riding nonstop for like six days now, all the while your guts have been spilling all over the place? Uh, how the hell did you survive? Uh, magic? You're Sauron, aren't you? Uh, no. You're Sauron! Stupid. Why did the writers literally spend an entire scene having the people of Numenor decide what kind of coffin they wanted the king to have? Is this really something we're gonna spend our billion dollar budget on? Really? You can't think of anything more interesting to kill time? Okay, this isn't really a leap in logic, but why do we care about Iarian? Oh, she found a passage to the Palantir. So what? Nobody has a Palantir yet, so there's no risk to looking into one, like when Aragorn did, so there is zero tension if she touches it. You already have a cast that has 90% of the characters doing basically nothing but taking up screen time so that your show stretches out into eight hours. Stop trying to get us invested in yet another block of wood. She's stupid and I hate her, despite the literal metric tons of adipose tissue located on her chest. <laughs> Why is every single woman on this show completely incapable of taking any criticism, or compliments for that matter, from a man? Literally every single strong female character in this show gets completely offended when any of her male peers say anything to them. You're doing well. Patronize me like that again, Captain. I'll have your ship. I want to hear about you. Why, Elrond? You really have become a politician. I'm not some courtier to be placated by idle flattery. This is not how you write a character that's likable, buttheads. It doesn't make you strong if you're just an asshole to literally everybody. You think anyone would like Aragorn if he reprimanded anyone that talks to him? No! Assholery does not equal strong and cool and respectable. It just equals assholery. I knew it. I'm surrounded by assholes. This is not a hard concept, but somehow it got past an entire board of writers. Why do I feel like the more I write about these plot holes and contrivances that my risk for cancer goes up? Why does Elendil never say the reason that he took Galadriel on his ship? He asks Muriel if she knows why and then he never goes on to explaining it. He just like talks about his name and then talks about all the things that he could have done rather than take her on his ship, but he never says why he actually took her on his ship. Why, writers, does your dialogue continue to just fold on itself? When you ask a question, we expect an answer, dickhead. Why do we spend so much time quibbling about what to make the Mithril into? One object for all Middle-earth. Precisely what manner of object? It would be smaller than previously imagined, something that could be carried. A circular form will be ideal, allowing the light to arc back upon itself in one unbroken round. Stop beating around the bush! A ring! You're gonna make a ring! There it is, I said it! Can you please freaking move on? This is taking too long! Enough jibber-jabber, just get to the point, okay? Why in the Dumbo Piss Goblin does Gilgalad forbid Calebrimbor for making the one thing that can save Middle-earth? That's been his whole arc for the entire show! To save Middle-earth! Now that Calebrimbor has a way of doing that, you don't want to because he did it a little bit later than you wanted him to? That is unbelievably stupid. That would be like deciding against mass distribution of the polio vaccine because the scientists needed more time to develop it. Calebrimbor, you're fired! If you can't save Middle-earth on time, then don't save it at all! Asinine. Why in the Doobie Von Cannonball does Killa Brimbor just trust the most random homeless vagabond to work on his forge and use his tools? He knows less than nothing about this dude, and yet he just lets him moonwalk all around his forge like he's Michael Jackson. Have you ever met a blacksmith before in real life? I happen to room with one. They are very protective of their tools, man, and that conviction would have been multiplied by about 
about a thousand times if it was the greatest blacksmith in the world, moronic. Why and freaking how is making an alloy of mithril strong enough to save all of Middle-earth from the evil black goo? The mithril only worked when it was within very close proximity of the dead leaf, and I mean very close proximity, like it had to be within inches to work. But now that we've made a few rings, all of the evil in Middle-earth is just gonna dissolve? Three puny rings. All of Middle-earth. All three million square miles of it. Really? If I whisper to somebody from a few feet away, should I be concerned that some dildo is gonna hear it from a thousand miles away? Cause it's about the exact same equivalent, you spoiled lentils. Whatever. Your own logic is dying from absurdity, kind of like your fans' minuscule amount of respect for your credibility. Why does this white liquid keep coming out of my ear the more I watch this show? I'm kind of concerned. I probably need to see a doctor at this point. Why is the only straight white male that is even the smallest bit competent also the most evil guy in Middle Earth? Are y'all trying to say something? It feels like you're trying to say something. Why is Galadriel involved in literally every single significant event in the show? Is she the Forrest Gump of Middle-earth? Eh, hey, we need to make this ring to save the world, you. I know, make it into three rings. Uh, we need really pure gold to make them and stuff. Uh, here's my dagger. Uh, none of our Numenorians know how to fight. Uh, Galadriel, teach us. And on and on and on. Nothing actually happens in Middle-earth without Galadriel putting her fat nose in it, didn't you know? It's actually quite remarkable. Fascinating. How in the flaming pig turd did faux Gandalf learn how to speak perfect English within two weeks of being with Irish hobbits? And also, how does he not have an Irish accent? The only exposure he's had to common tongue has been with the Irish hobbits. How does he have his own accent that also happens to be the accent of everyone else in Middle-earth? Dumb and stupid. Well, maybe it is stupid, but it's also dumb. Why do the writers think that having the same Frodo and Sam dynamic should be done again? And much more incompetently. Er, you know what would be cool? If we had a Frodo and a Sam, but made them women. My boy's wicked smart. Nobody cares. At all. Like, at all. Why do they take like 10 minutes of this episode to say goodbye to not Frodo? It took so long that I was praying for a meteor to hit my house directly for like a solid five minutes or so. I'm still waiting on that to happen. Why do the Elven Rings look like shit compared to the Jackson series rings when this show literally had more than three times the budget? Seriously, they look like someone just took an uncut diamond and slapped it onto a piece of gold paint plastic. Well done, Kella Dumbor. You suck at what you're supposedly famous for. And lastly, why do the writers think that anyone is going to be invested in season two and therefore bother to make meaningless clips? hangers. I'm more invested in the shape of my cat's turds after I change up his diet than I am in this pish. Nobody cares! And of course, we need a quick montage of all of the Peter Jackson callbacks. Place in a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the Lord! I would make you a queen, fair as the sea and the sun, stronger than the foundations of the earth. Sauron needs only this ring to cover all the lands of a second darkness. And the shadow will spread and darken to cover all the world. If you die, you know, always follow your nose. When in doubt, always follow your nose. Jealousy is all this is, my friends. Ugly, disgusting jealousy. I wanted to end this video with a message to the Amazon sires in their ivory towers. Something that they will probably never hear, but something that definitely they should hear. My question to all of you is, was it worth it? Were the billions of dollars spent to make the most expensive TV show of all time only for it to fall out of the top 10 streamed shows of this year a week after the show ended worth it? Was the constant silencing of opinions and apparent troll and the blocking of ratings and YouTube comments worth not even getting a Golden Globe Award? <laughs> That's gotta hurt. Was the firing of actual Tolkien lovers and replacing them with woke shills who hated everything Tolkien stood for 
worth the complete drop off of viewers after every single episode of streaming your show was the $250 million buy of the rights in order to purchase the love and devotion of an existing fan base worth the absolutely devastating blowback from fans and Tolkien purists all across the world because they recognized that this was the most expensive cash grab on the planet with no actual love for the writings of the one of the greatest authors of all time? Was it worth the turning the small group of people that maybe did support this suicidal deal against you by saying that anyone who criticized your work was racist, sexist bigots? Was it worth it putting on this clever veneer of love for the source material in order to backpedal and gaslight the viewers into believing that your desecration of a great story really was faithful to the original source? Especially when that just simply made people even more angry regarding you as liars in order to try and stand up to the giants like Peter Jackson and Tom Shippey, who had an actual love and respect for the Tolkien works? Was all of this fighting to stay relevant and bad-mouthing the haters worth the eventual fade into obscurity worth it? Was your destruction of an epic work worth making people nostalgic for the abysmal Hobbit movies worth it? Oh man! I bet it wasn't. You know what you writers could have done to actually maybe save this grotesque work of yours? Take a hard look in the mirror and realize that the hate you are getting from the fans come from a place of passion and not toxicity or racism or sexism. When it comes to fans, it is a fan's right to have whatever opinion they want to have. And people are going to be upset because you're never going to be the exact person who they had in their head or who they played on Witcher 3, for example. I don't necessarily consider that toxic. I just consider that passionate. You could have listened to all of the very well-found criticism and started to take a step in the right direction and actually follow the blueprints of the second age that Tolkien himself laid out. You decided to mess with something that has become ever so sacred to millions of fantasy lovers. You tried to win them over with flashy lights and gorgeous set designs and massive budgets and endless callbacks when all you needed to do was be faithful to the source material. There's a reason that I reread the amazing works of Tolkien this year for the fifth time in a row, and there's a reason that people continuously return to Middle-earth over and over and over again on a daily basis. There's a reason that I bought yet another copy of The Lord of the Rings, but there was because it was a special edition and it has the cool writing on it and stuff. There's a reason I spent $70 on a book that I already have six copies of. There's a reason that Peter Jackson's movies did so well and are regarded with love and respect by even some of the harshest of Tolkien purists and scholars. There's a reason that J.R.R. Tolkien is a household name and is regarded as the father of modern day fantasy and has been before any media has come out adapting any of his work. There's a reason that people have spent their entire lives trying to peer into the genius and well of knowledge that came from one man. It is J.R.R. Tolkien. It is his world. It's nobody else but him. It's a fantasy world that we all grew up with. It's something that has been a rock in our lives and has taught us to harness our creative outlets into making something extraordinary. No matter how much we delved and absorbed of Tolkien's work, there's always something new to discover and something beautiful to cherish. Our love and devotion can't be bought. It's earned. You want Tolkien enthusiasts to love you and to fund every single decision you make with their own money in gigantic amounts of support? Follow Tolkien. Idolize his writing. Make his messages and his ideals and his spirit the only sole motivation you have for bringing this work to the big screen. Show that you really are passionate about making a faithful and beautiful adaptation, that your impulses are genuine, and that you are powered by a love for Middle Earth and nothing else. Show that every single resolution you conclude with is purely inspired by Tolkien and not any political agendas or popular activisms or fundamentally race-based ideologies or disingenuous diversity and inclusivity. Stick to Tolkien. If you do this, I promise you, you will never ask for another penny. If you do this, I promise you, 
that you will be looked upon as giants and architects and heroes to all of the Middle Earth fandom. I promise you that your show would become the most successful TV show of all time. You would be raking in the money and the notoriety. You will be championed as geniuses and pioneers and visionaries that brought the world into a whole new fantasy cinematic experience. You will have all of the respect and praise that you want so badly. It really is that simple. Adapt Tolkien's work faithfully. Make metric tons of cash. Want to see what I'm talking about? Do you not believe me? Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. In 2001, it made $891,216,824. Number two, Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, 2002, $919,148,764. Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, 2003. $1,120,210,896. Collectively, Jackson's first trilogy that was so incredibly faithful to the works made a total of $2,930,517,000. Four dollars. Holy crap. Holy crap. Holy crap. That is just short of three billion dollars. That's your whole budget times three. And that was back in 2001, more than 20 years ago. You want to know how much that money would be now adjusted for inflation? That money today would be worth four billion. $926,396,700.33. Just under $5 billion. Are you kidding me? That's a smog's hoard worth of dough. You could build a bonfire and burn only money and never need to buy firewood again. You could literally buy Haiti with that money and use it as your own private home. That is so much flipping money. Did this motivate you to actually adapt Tolkien's work well? I doubt it. Because you've got your heads so far up your asses that you thought the only solution to fixing your total suckage of a show was because each episode wasn't directed by a woman. Are you kidding me? You thought that that was the problem? You thought the problem was that you didn't have enough female directors? Are you kidding me? You've got to be f kidding. <laughs> How stupid can you be? Anyways, I'm done. I passed the test. I defeated the dragon. I watched all eight hours of literal eye poison and only had to stop myself from suicide five times. Thank heavens. Be prepared though, because I'm not stopping. Next video I will release will be a detailed deconstruction of every single retardedly stupid argument that I've heard regarding defending this putrescent show. Here we go again. Also, let me know if there's anything out there that you guys want to see. I have a bit more free time now, so I'm going to be hopefully uploading more and more often. Please go and watch the first Jackson trilogy. That is the first thing I'm going to do for Christmas this year. I beg you. They are so good. They are the pinnacle of fantasy and storytelling and great cinema meshed perfectly together. I love them even more every time I watch them. 12 hours of my life spent in no other way. I could literally die in the middle of watching one of them and I'd be a happy man. As for eight hours that I will never get back, Rings of Power, I'm happy to say f you and everything that you stand for and f everyone that had a hand in making you. And may God have mercy on your soul. I hope this show finds the nearest volcano and yeets itself into oblivion. Everyone hates you and you will slowly pass into the phase that every writer fears and that is apathy. No one cares anymore and no one will ever care. Goodbye now and forever, you sadistic pigs. I wish you the absolute worst of fortunes. Good riddance. Peace out, bitches.